Now let me introduce um, different remote sensing platforms. So usually when we're talking about remote sensing uh, platforms, there are three types of them. The first is called surface platform or in situ platform. Usually we use handhold or car-based equipment to, to collect spectral information of different ground objects. Okay, then we have the second category, which is airborne, which means we use aircraft, uh, such as a plane, uh, a drone to carry sensors to fly in the sky, right? Or um, uh, in the history, we used balloon or even kite to do that. And the third type is called spaceborne. Um, we use rocket to, 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 to deliver uh, satellites. Right, so satellites, they are uh, orbiting the Earth and sensors can be mounted on satellites, okay, or, or manned spacecraft, okay. So on the right side, we have a, a, a figure to illustrate different platforms, right. Uh, uh, um, we could carry sensors on a ship, um, on, on a car or a handhold. Right, and uh, airborne um, aircraft can be used to carry sensors, and uh, in the space we can use satellite to carry sensors. And um, I think uh, in among three categories of um, platforms, remote sensing platform, the most special one is in situ measurement. You may ask, uh, we're talking about remote sensing. Um, I understand that we can use aircraft or satellites to carry sensors to get large scale uh, um, um, temporarily uh, continuous data, right? Uh, why do we even need in situ measurement? Uh, I'm going to tell you why, but before that, I want to provide some examples, okay? On the left side, we have a very famous brand for field spectrometer, it's called ASD. So, Basically, this equipment is a combination of a, uh, of a laptop and a spectrometer. So here we have a gun, it's a handheld spectro, spectrometer gun. So when you are aiming this gun to a specific object, uh, the spectrometer will collect the reflective, not reflective, we, we should call it reflection spectrum of that object which means uh, the spectrometer will collect the reflectance of that object at different wavelengths, okay? So eventually you could have a continuous spectrum, reflective spectrum of that object. Of, 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 of that object. So here, uh, not very clear, but we can say here is a curve, right? So usually the horizontal axis is, is the wavelength. And the vertical one, the vertical axis here is the reflectance. So at each specific wavelength, there is a, a, a specific reflection for that object. So um, some of you may have, um, may have found out how to use this spectrum. Yes, each object has a different spectrum, which means the shape of the, of the spectrum for each object is different. It's just like your fingerprint. Some objects, they may have high reflectance at red band, low reflectance at green band, and the different reflectance at different bands, right? Since each object has different combinations of this reflectance at different bands, so this curve, the shape of, of, of the uh, ref reflective spectrum, um, is different from one object to another, so we can use this to identify different objects on the ground. On the right side, the idea here is the same, but this time the sensor is held by this crane or by this truck. So you can just um, detect a, a larger area because the sensor here is obviously higher than a handhold sensor. As uh, as one uh, in the left figure, right? And uh, uh, more images uh, on how to use handhold um, equipment to do in situ measurement, right? For example, on the right side, we have this very small uh, spectrometer um, to, to, to 
this is actually not a spectrometer. Spectrometer only collects a uh, reflection of uh, different objects, but this one, um, septometer, it can be used to directly measure something called LAI, leaf area index. This is an index we're going to uh, face, um, we're going to talk about it later in this class, but LAI is just an index to indicate um, the size of the size of leaves for vegetation. It is an indicator of biomass of vegetation. And you, you may know that biomass is a, a, is a direct indicator for, for the health of vegetation, okay, three images here. So next, now let's talk about the reason why we need in situ data collection. We're talking about remote sensing. So usually you may think that it's about aircraft, it's about satellite, but in situ measurement is also important. Okay, so to be of greatest value, the original remotely sensed data must usually be calibrated in two distinct ways. First one, it should be geometrically and radiometrically calibrated so that remotely sensed data obtained on different dates can be compared with one another. Okay, also the remotely sensed data must usually be calibrated or compared with what is on the ground in terms of biophysical or cultural characteristics. So field work is necessary to achieve both objectives. In summary, we need to do in situ measurement to create baselines, to create references, because when we are measuring on the ground, it's actually more accurate than the data collected uh, by sensors because I mean after all they're in the sky the advantage of them is covering larger area and they can just um, monitoring they can monitor the surface of the earth continuously that's their advantages but if you compare the accuracy in situ measurement is much more accurate than remotely sensed data Okay, so basically we need in situ data collection for creating a spectrum library uh, to create baseline, to create uh, references. So when we're getting data from um, airborne or spaceborne sensors, we can compare them uh, with the library, with the spectrum library, with the baseline. Okay, so in situ data measurement is important and it's very expensive. If you compare the equipment, um, the equipment is less, I mean, obviously less expensive than satellites and sensors, but you have to send people to the field to collect data, right? Can be very expensive. And now let's talk about different types of sensors or remote sensing sensor models, okay? There are several of them. The first one is called framing systems. Some sensors, they're just like this cube here. They're just like this cube here. You can consider this cube is a sensor. And this arrow here is indicating the movement, uh, the direction of the movement of the sensor. This sensor can be on a plane, can be on a satellite, doesn't matter, okay? It moves along this direction and there is a shutter and there is a lens. This is just a camera. You can actually consider this frame system as a, as a camera you are using every day. So uh, after, after each um, opening and closing of the shutter, there is a photo. In remote sensing, we call it an image. Okay, so this whole square on the ground, this area is covered by each photo, by each image. So um, the shutter opens and close. Then we have a whole image. And when the sensor moves forward, you can, you, you can just adjust the speed of the shutter, okay, the frequency of the opening of opening and closing of the shutter to get uh, multiple images. Okay, so this is very easy, I think. Um, let's just say not easy, simple or straightforward to understand, right? But 
besides framing systems, we have scanning systems. They are different from framing systems because they are scanning the, the area of interest pixel by pixel or line by line. And under scanning systems, there are two subcategories. The first one is called a cross track scanning or whisk broom scanning. Systems scan the terrain along sky lines using a rotating or a sailing uh, uh, as a, a rotating or oscillating mirror. Okay. Uh, the second subcategory is called a long track scanning or push broom scanning. These systems they record successive sky lines using a linear array of detectors along a swath beneath an aircraft or um, or or satellite. Okay, and uh, for uh, for for push broom scanning, each spectral band of sensing requires its own linear array. So, what are they? Sounds nonsense or <laughs> hard to understand figures here. Okay, so let's talk about a cross track scanner or whisk broom scanner here. On the right side, we have an illustration for the scanning system. So there is one single detector, okay? And there is also a, a rotating mirror. So here is a detector. Here is a detector, right? And here is a rotating, uh, rotating scan arrow. And here, here is a motor to, to control this rotating scan mirror. When this mirror is rotating, it will collect information from different pixels on the ground. And this mirror will reflect the reflected energy from the ground and make sure that the reflected energy is eventually arriving at this detector and collected by the detector. Again, on the ground, here we have an arrow indicating the movement of the detector. And you can say as this um, aircraft or the detector or the sensing system, you can call it as you want. It is moving to a specific direction. The detector is collecting information from multiple lines because the mirror is rotating. So the information on the ground is collected line by line. So at the very beginning is this line, then second line, third line, fourth line, fifth line, as long as you are moving. A lot of lines perpendicular to your direction of movement, they are created on the ground. Uh, they're not actually created, but you can imagine that they are created on the ground. And the information on the ground is collected line by line. And at a specific time, at a specific time, there is an IFO way on the ground. IFO way equals what? Instantaneous field of view, okay, determines ground resolution cell, okay, at a specific time, at a specific time, detector can collect the information of a small cell on the ground. And the, the size of this, uh, of this uh, cell um, determines the spatial resolution of the sensor. For example, now at a specific time, this this small cell is is what is monitored by this sensing system and the size of this cell is 30 meter by 30 meter so the spatial resolution of your sensing system is 30 meter which means what which means that this cell here is the smallest unit that can be detected by this sensor in other words, this is the size, the actual size of a pixel in your image, which means that each pixel in your image is covering a 30 meter by 30 meter real world area on the ground. Okay. And we also have angular field of view, AFOA. It determines ground swath. It's the width of ground strip, right? The, actually, the length of this what 
the length of each skyline here is what? Is a swath. It's a width of ground straight. This is um, straightforward, right? And image is built by successive skylines produced by forward motion of sensor. So this sensor is moving this direction, right? Forward moving of the sensor will produce multiple skylines. So objects on the ground, they are scanning line by line, okay? So uh, uh, this is a waste broom system. Okay, now let's talk about another type of scanning system. It's called a long track scanner or push broom scanner. So in this type of uh, 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 sensing system, there is a linear array of CCDs or charge coupled device. Uh, CCDs, they are everywhere today uh, as long as you want to take a photo. On your phone, uh, in your camera, there is always CCDs. So here we have this sensor. This is a, an array of CCDs. Each small square here, or not square, each small cube here is a detector. So it's an array of detector. So this time it's similar to the whisker broom system. Um, the sensing system is moving forward along this direction, right? But here there is no rotating mirror. There is no rotating mirror. So this, this sensor, this array of sensors will look at what? A specific line simultaneously. And each one is responsible for a specific pixel or a specific cell. So when this sensor is moving along this direction, we have multiple skylines. This is similar to the whisk broom system, but this time, these skylines, they are not perpendicular to the movement direction of the sensing system. They are parallel to the direction of movement, right? Direction of the movement is here, indicated by this huge arrow. And these small arrows, they are for the scanning direction of each skyline. Right? So they are perpendicular to each other. So there is no scanning system. And the swath width is determined by the length of linear array. As long as this array increases, of course, you can, you can add more uh, sensors to this array to make it wider and wider. So the width, the swath width will increase. If you decrease the number of detectors here, of course, the swath width will also decrease. And the ground resolution cell size is determined by the size of individual detectors. This makes sense, right? Because we have multiple sensors here. They are looking at this a specific line at a specific time. And each one is responsible for a small segment of this of this line they're looking at, right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. 10 cells here. We should have one, two, three, four, five. Obviously, um, there should be more, uh, five more detectors here, but for illustration, it's not accurate here, right? We have 10 scan lines. We should have 10 detectors, okay? And uh, if the detector is huge, then because it, each detector is responsible for a cell, if it is huge, then the cell is huge, then the spatial resolution is low, okay? okay? The smaller the cell, the smaller the exercise um, covered by a cell, the higher the spatial resolution. So uh, 30 meter spatial resolution is higher than a 100 meter spatial resolution. And if you are using a push broom system, the size of the detector actually decides the size of the cell and then decides what spatial resolution of your remote sensing system, eventually uh, spatial resolution of your image, okay? And the image is built by successive linear array images produced by forward motion of the sensor. So as the sensor moves forward, as the system moves forward, right? There are multiple skylines. Right. And uh, uh, these detectors, they are responsible for 
for for for the area along their own skyline. Okay, okay. And uh, now let's talk about different characteristics of sensors. Okay, the first aspect of sensor characteristics I want to discuss here is orbit. So there are different types, um, actually two types of satellite orbits. The first type is called sun synchronous or polar orbits. They're like this, okay? So um, the gray line here is indicating the, the self-rotation of Earth. And the right line here is what? Is indicating the actual orbit of a satellite, of a polar orbit satellite. Okay, it means that um, there is always an angle between the between the orbit of a uh, of the satellite and the what and the axis of the Earth. Of the Earth, okay, they cannot um, uh, cover each other. They cannot, uh, or I should say this: there is always a non-zero angle between the plane of the orbit and the axis of the Earth. The axis of the Earth should be biased, not perpendicular, right? Okay, and uh, the orbit satellite, uh, the sun synchronous or polar orbits, they're usually 600 meter kilometers to 1000 kilometers over the third uh, Earth's surface, which means the, 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 the orbit can be pretty high, can be relatively low. Okay, and the reason why this type of orbit is called sun synchronous or polar is that firstly, firstly, um, if a satellite is using polar orbit, it will fly over to polars. Okay, that's why it's called polar orbit. The reason why it's called sun synchronous um, orbit is because that the angle between the plane of the sun and the plane formed by this orbit stays the same, stays the same, okay? That's why it's called sun synchronous. And uh, you should know that for sun synchronous or, or, or polar orbits, the height of the orbit could change. It is decided by the designer and uh, the manufacturer of the satellite. On the other hand, we have Earth synchronous or geostationary orbit. This orbit is very special. The satellite orbit height is decided is 35,786 kilometers over the third uh, Earth's surface. And there is no relative movement between Earth and satellite. It means that when the, the Earth is rotating at a specific angular speed, the satellite will also rotate with the same speed, with the same angular speed. What does it mean? It means that once a geostationary satellite is successfully launched, it will stay in the sky and look at the same area indefinitely. Because when the Earth rotates, it will, the satellite will also rotate at the same angular. So what's the advantage of this satellite? You can focus on a specific area on the Earth continuously. For example, uh, some wider satellites, they are using this type of orbit. For example, if a US is launching a wider satellite, of course, this light satellite should serve US to, so this satellite should look at North American continuously. So, of course, I should just send a geostationary uh, uh, satellite to look at North American continuously. Okay, but the disadvantage of this type of orbit is that you cannot, you cannot say other areas around the Earth. And usually, usually the vision of one geostationary orbit is one third of the Earth's surface. So if you can launch three 
uh, geostationary orbit satellites. Theoretically, you can cover the whole surface of the Earth because each one can cover one third of the surface of the Earth. Okay, so there is another interesting problem here. Okay, since, since a satellite, if a satellite is using geostationary orbit, it must be right above the Earth with this specific distance, right? It means that there is only one orbit for all geostationary satellites. What does it mean? It's a resource. This orbit is a resource. It means that if your country cannot launch geostationary orbit satellite, maybe after years, this whole orbit will be fully occupied, will be fully occupied because there is only one geostationary orbit. It's a long orbit, I would say that. You can calculate, you can calculate because you know the radius of this circle, right? Right? You can calculate the parameter of this, of this circle. It's a huge circle, but still it's, it's, it's a resources. It's a re resource. So now big countries, um, they are, they, of course, uh, China, Russian, uh, Russia, um, um, Great Britain, France, US, these space huge countries, they do not have any problems um, occupying this orbit as, as much as they want. But some, some, some poor countries, small countries, I know that some countries, um, they simply send some satellites to the sky to, to occupy a position for geostationary orbit. Uh, even though those satellites, they are useless, they are just occupying a specific a loc a location in the sky, position in the sky. It's just you reserve a seat <laughs> in a restaurant. So future, maybe why you need to actually launch a satellite to uh, with specific functions, at least now you can occupy the position. Because for example, right, uh, if US uh, sent a, a geostationary satellite here to look at North America, but this position can also be used to observe Latin America and South America. If these positions that can observe the North American and South Americans, these positions, if they have been occupied, all, all occupied by US, how about other countries within this area? How about Canada? How about Brazil? How about Mexico? Because there is only one orbit. US has occupied most of them in, in future other countries, if they want to use same positions, they cannot use it because there are already satellites from US. Okay, so this is the second type of um, satellite orbits is called geostationary orbits. Okay, uh, I will just stop here and I will see you in the next video of this lecture. Thank you.